This is the, the Clark Lecture. Uh, the Clark Family Lecture um, was named in honor of Philip and Doris Clark for their generous support of the Notre Dame Medical Ethics Conference throughout the years. Dr. Clark, many of you may have known Dr. Clark personally. He was an alumnus of Notre Dame and a specialist in internal medicine. He served as dean of the University of Colorado College of Medicine. We're very grateful for the Clark family's support for creating this opportunity for us to gather each year to grapple with these pressing issues in medical ethics. This year's Clark lecturer, uh, it's a very special treat for me to introduce her. Uh, she's an extraordinary person and a friend, a, a good friend of mine and also of the University of Notre Dame and the Center for Ethics and Culture. Dr. Monique Chiro is an assistant professor in the Division of Clinical and Epidemiological Research in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Duke University Medical Center. She received her medical degree at Brown University, her Master's of Public Health from Harvard, and completed her residency at uh, Yale University. Her research interests include adverse pregnancy outcomes and long-term health, racial disparities in women's health, and women's veterans' health and health care. She's a public policy fellow here at the University of Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. The title of her presentation today is The Transformation of Reproductive Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Monique Chirot. Thanks, Carter. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm uh, uh, always just so, it's such an enjoyable experience coming out here to Notre Dame and Notre Dame. And uh, I do want to thank Carter. I want to thank the uh, center for inviting me and for uh, the privilege of uh, being associated with the center. Um, as Carter has indicated, I am an OBGYN. Um, my uh, research is in the area of uh, health services research as well as the molecular biology of pregnancy complications. I also have an active clinical practice in obstetrics and gynecology. However, I don't want this talk to be entirely focused on um, obstetrics and gynecology as I believe there are greater issues. However, let's see. I do need to uh, do my disclosures. I've been hoping throughout my career that someday I will have some disclosures that pharmaceutical companies will be giving me a half a million dollars a year, but that's, that's not happened to date. So uh, I don't have any uh, financial disclosures, sorry to say, and uh, neither do I have any uh, commercial interests or uh, relationships with industry that would compromise my integrity, at least uh, as, that I'm aware of. So my talk, as uh, Carter's indicated, is uh, about the transformation of reproductive health. Why re reproductive health? Issues around reproductive health are at the forefront of the most contentious, seemingly intractable and difficult issues that we face in the area of bioethics currently. Um, they are the subject of intense and often uh, bitter uh, confrontation and ethical debate, discourse, and conflict. Why is that? Um, these issues do span the gamut. Partly the reason is that these issues do span the gamut from personal to public morality. They impact on some of the very most personal aspects of human life as well as human biology, um, ethics, practice, and policy. And by practice, I do mean both medical practice and public health practice. The, the pervasiveness of this, these issues creates a sense of urgency and crisis. We feel that we are not only dealing with issues related to personal morality and public morality, but also to what our society means. Are we a civilized society? Are we a just and virtuous society? To quote a number of uh, different, <coughs> excuse me, just gonna grab some water here. To quote a number of different speakers and authors. And so we do also consider the threats that uh, these reproductive health issues pose to individuals, communities, and societies, because there are very real threats involved. But, in my opinion, we must not think for a moment that the solutions are legal, political, or legislative, and the only solution to these problems is transformation. Now the problems surrounding reproductive health are deeply spiritual. This is one of the major issues that often gets overlooked in our debate. And of course, they require, spiritual problems require spiritual as well as other types of transformation. So-called reproductive health, as it has been defined uh, in policy, in the media, in culture, and even in medical practice and public health practice, 
is in a constant state of change, progression, and regression. Partly because, partly this is because it is closely linked to scientific discovery and technology, personal and societal mores and norms, and human biology, all of which are undergoing greater or lesser degrees of change as our understanding and our cultural uh, explanations of these issues undergo development. For example, in the area of human biology, it is a fact that in the 21st century, many girls are going through puberty earlier. What, does, what is the significance of that? It's because possibly of uh, increased body fat and obesity, the association between increased body fat and obesity appears to uh, have something to do with the onset of prepubertal, prepubertal changes and puberty itself. This association appears to be very complex. It appears to at least have some genetic components to it, but it has significant implications for reproductive health. Why? When girls develop earlier, they begin to uh, experience embarrassment. Sometimes they attract the attention of predators. Sometimes they attract the attention of boys. And it's difficult for younger children, younger girls, to begin to embrace the idea of womanhood when they're eight or nine years old. So this is an example of how Changing human biology causes changes in medical practice and also changes in what our public policy response and our public health response should be to these changes. Moreover, the transformative changes that have occurred in reproductive health have not occurred ex nihilo, even though some appear to have occurred explosively over the last 50 years or so. For example, uh, the abortion epidemic, the uh, uh, widespread availability of contraception might be looked upon as having occurred very recently and very dramatically. But a closer look shows that these have really been more incremental in their development. Now let's look at the definition of reproductive health. Words are important. Words help us not only to communicate but also to try to understand what exactly the concepts are that are underlying the, these ideas of reproductive health. The World Health Organization defines reproductive health as a state of complete mental, physical, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Reproductive health addresses the reproductive processes, functions, and system at all stages of life. That's not unreasonable. However, it then goes on to say that reproductive health therefore implies that people are able to have a responsible, satisfying, and safe sex life and that they have the capability to reproduce and the freedom to decide if, when, and how often to do so. Implicit in this are the right of men and women. This is continuing the definition. Implicit in this are the right of men and women to be informed of and to have access to safe, effective, affordable, and acceptable methods of fertility regulation of their choice, and the right of access to appropriate health care services that will enable women to go safely through pregnancy and childbirth and provide couples with the best chance of having a healthy infant. There are a number of problems with this particular definition of reproductive health, as I'm sure you're all quickly aware of. It's reductionistic. It focuses on sexual expression and satisfaction on one hand and contraception on the other. It does not address the fact that some forms of sexual expression are illegal in addition to being immoral. It does not mention marriage, perhaps deliberately. It opens the door for rights-based ethics. It ignores, again, perhaps purposefully, the essential nature of humans that because we are spiritual beings, there's a, there is a spiritual dimension to sex and sexuality. It implies a flawed ethical framework for sexuality and reproduction and sets the stage for what is often called a contraceptive mentality. And the term contraceptive mentality was uh, coined back in the uh, late 20th century, um, and um, a great deal of the work around the idea of a contraceptive contraceptive mentality, as many of you are aware, uh, was uh, uh, developed through um, Catholic thinkers um, and social scientists. It was pointed out as early as the 1940s and 1950s that widespread acceptance of contraception would not only undermine morality, but would undermine marriage as well. And in some ways, this has been seen to be true. So what is the transformation of reproductive health? Briefly stated, a transformation from the current reductio, morally and ethically impoverished ethic of reproductive health, and the practice as well, is urgently needed. However, this cannot be properly affected without an understanding of the history, ethics, theology, and practices in this area. 
So I'd like to go through uh, how reproductive health is defined and what its current context is, what is the historical context, what ethical frameworks were used to justify its transformations at different stages. We'll see that the whole concept of reproductive health, even though the term is relatively new, dates back millennia, and that various ethical frameworks have been used to develop and turn this concept and this particular uh, uh, idea of reproductive health in different directions. What theological resources can we draw upon to affect transformation? The true uh, fruit of ethics is action. So without having an ethical foundation for right action, for morality, and for proper practice, ethics merely becomes an abstract idea. How can we use eth ethical theory and the tools of integrative thought and cultural engagement to bring about transformation? Now, it's very interesting to me as an OBGYN, um, and again, I trained uh, a long time ago. Um, actually, uh, when I began training, there was no rapid test for pregnancy. So that shows you that I've, I've, been, I've been practicing for a while. Uh, but going back, back years, it's really interesting that when people speak of reproductive health, the focus is almost always single-mindedly on women. Now, both sexes participate, by definition, both sexes participate in reproduction. But the debate around the ethics of contraception, um, the ethics of reproductive health is concerned mostly with women. Why is that? It's always been a source of interest to me. Why is the role of the male not only secondary, but virtually invisible? Partly this is because women are visibly and physically responsible for gestation. Until fairly recently, men's individual participation in procreation was largely inferential. As I've heard it said, um, only God and a woman know what's in her belly. That's a kind of a pithy West Indian uh, statement. But really, until uh, a, a fairly surely, short, brief, brief, fairly brief period of time, um, there were no reliable paternity tests. The DNA has changed all that. But again, it's it's really not been a very long time. And so for the most part, efforts to identify paternity, confirm paternity, um, have been inferential. Another part I fear has to do with the original war on women, and I'm gonna to return to that topic in a bit. Now the term reproductive health, as I said earlier, is relatively new and dates from the 1980s. Examination of the genesis of this term is instructive. Prior to talking about that, I'd like to talk a little bit about sexuality and reproduction of women's health. Now, each of these subjects is vast. Very briefly, in antiquity, amongst all cultures, views on women's sexuality were largely superstitious. There are many taboos and prohibitions. There's a focus on fertility, given high mortality rates among both adults and children. This is a typical piece of art. This is from... Um, uh, West Africa. I was recently in uh, West Africa. I was in Cameroon. I was in um, Uganda and also South Sudan. I actually just got back about two weeks ago. What's fascinating about all of these images is that these ladies have no faces. If you look at a majority of them, they don't have faces. So what does that say about views about women's sexuality in antiquity? That they're very generic. They're very focused on women as objects of reproduction, as objects of fertility, as objects of sexual pleasure, but not as thinking, rational human beings, not as people who are involved in the decision-making process about sex and sexuality. Um, I'm not a feminist. I consider myself a post-feminist. Again, I'm sort of implicating myself as to my age, but I, I came of age in the, at the height of the feminist movement, and so I know, uh, actually lived through it. Um, and at the same time, it is always very interesting to me to see the difference between the, how cultures viewed women and viewed women's sexuality um, in the absence of any sort of pers personalization. This is in a sharp contrast to scripture. Scripture makes it very clear that women are made, as well as men are made, in the image and likeness of God, and I'm gonna to return to that later, and that because of that, women and men have inherent dignity before God. As I mentioned, the role of women was highly restricted. 
In these cultures, medicine was usually practiced by shamans or witch doctors and traditional healers, as it still is in many societies. When I was visiting West Africa and East Africa, this was a very prominent feature of the culture, that if you were ill, if you were infertile, you would go to get juju, juju being some kind of a uh, shamanistic spell that was cast or some kind of sacred material that you would obtain. If you feared that a woman was taking your husband, you would get a little pouch of charms and you would put it on the door or under the bed or you would get poison and you, you would poison that person. So what's significant about that is that the spiritual or priestly roles were and still are in these cultures inextricably entwined with the healing and killing roles. This dual nature of medicine appears in Plato's Republic where physicians are expected both to heal society's philosopher guardians and kill defective newborns or maimed athletes. For example, in the Republic 5, 461, and on the young men, surely, who excel in war and other pursuits, we must bestow honors and prizes, and in particular, the opportunity of more frequent intercourse with the women, which will at the same time be a plausible pretext for having them beget as many of the children as possible. And the children thus born will be taken over by the officials, in other words, the guardians, the leaders of the culture, appointed for this, men or women or both, since I take it the official posts too are common to men and women. The offspring of the good, I suppose, they will take to the pen or the creche. This is kind of the communal area. To certain nurses who live apart in a quarter of the city, but the offspring of the inferior and any of those of the other sort who are born defective, they will properly dispose of in secret so that no one will know what has become of them. That is the condition, he said, of preserving the purity of the guardian's breed. It's a eugenic statement if I've ever heard one. He goes on to say, but when I take it the men and the women have passed the age of lawful procreation, which for women began at age 20 and went up to about 40, men began in the, around age 20 or 30 and went up to the age at which they could no longer run a certain distance within, with a certain speed. The, um, we shall leave the men free to form relations with whomsoever they please, except daughter and mother and their direct descendants and ascendants, and likewise the women, say with son and father, and so on. First, admonishing them preferably not even to bring to light anything whatever thus conceived, but if they are unable to prevent a birth, to dispose of it on the understanding that we cannot rear such an offspring. So the understanding is clear in this quote that not only was contraceptive technology available in antiquity, and there are certain plants that were known um, to, uh, that one was able to take orally, um, there were certain plants that were known to produce sterilization. For example, it was widely stated that if you took two teaspoonfuls of the seeds of the plant hellebore for two years, you would become sterile. Um, physicians from that time, and I wasn't able to pull up any examples of this, uh, visual examples of this, um, would produce pessaries, which are small cups that would be inserted into the vagina, which had specific herbal mixtures. And it was understood that if these herbal mixtures came into contact with the cervix and were absorbed, they would affect an abortion. Um, similarly, there were other herbs that were used for contraception. And not only um, does he state that they could prevent birth, but also that infanticide would be practiced as well but the recommendation was for abortion rather than infanticide. Let's go on to uh, Aristotle in the politics. He states, as to exposing or rearing the children born, let there be a law that no deformed child shall be reared, but on the ground of number of children, if the regular customs hinder any of those born being exposed, there must be a limit fixed to the procreation of offspring. And if any people have a child, as a result of intercourse and contravention, abortion must be practiced on it before it has developed sensation in life. For the line between lawful and unlawful abortion will be marked by the fact of having sensation being alive. This sounds very familiar. So we see two things here. First, that despite our respect and admiration for Aristotelian and Platonic thought and philosophy, they were quite frank about the importance of eugenics, euthanasia, contraception, abortion, and infanticide. Now, to me, this is a key point. Why? Because it shows that their ethics, at some level and in some foundational way, were flawed. And while I believe that there were some good things that come out of Aristotelian and Platonic thought, one must truly question 
whether there's not a seed, some sort of a seed of uh, ethics, flawed ethics, that we can carry over into the 20th and 21st century. And I think that that's actually what happened. The second thought is that abortion and contraceptive technology, as I've indicated, were widely available and utilized. Third, that in ancient times, the decision for abortion or exposure, and let me just elaborate a bit about exposure. Um, under the um, Platonic, um, in the Republic, one, another issue that he discusses is that uh, how do you know? Because they didn't have a very clear idea about reproduction. The general idea in, in Greek thought at the time was that uh, conception occurred as a mixing of menstrual blood and semen. And so they didn't have an idea of the timing of conception. Um, they knew that the duration of uh, gestation was approximately 10 full moons or 10 months. However, um, one of the issues that he discusses in some detail is that the father was only obligated to acknowledge offspring that were born between seven and 10 months after marriage, okay? And if the father did not acknowledge offspring as his own, then the recourse was for them to be exposed, which means that you would leave the newborn out. There were certain areas outside of the cities where you would leave the newborns and they would then be eaten or killed, eaten by animals, wild animals are killed. So the decision for abortion or exposure, exposing an infant, was a pragmatic or utilitarian one, or perhaps values-based or re rarely deontological. One killed through abortion or infanticide because it's profitable to do so, if you were a physician, or as seen above, because a person had stepped outside the boundaries of their place in society. They had procreated outside of marriage. They had procreated outside the age at which they were allowed to procreate. Such killing was often the province of physicians, since they possessed the means, poison, and knowledge about the human body. So I would submit that from an ethical perspective, both the seeds and the solution for the current crisis in reproductive health were sown in Greek and Roman times. Some of the seeds did not come up until Hellenism, which was the neoclassical movement of the 18th and 19th centuries. Now, I'm going to jump a little bit, just step back. I said that I felt that part of the solution uh, was occurring, um, came out, of, was seeded during this period of time, and that was the Hippocratic Oath. So this is the Hippocratic Oath. It states, I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody if asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. Similarly, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. In Greek, it actually says, I will not give to a woman um, a drug known to cause abortion. In purity and holiness, I will guard my life and my art. And goes on to, to state other sort of ethical principles, ethical foundations. Again, I'm old enough that I did have to recite the Hippocratic Oath when I graduated from medical school. <coughs> it goes on to say that if I fulfill this oath and do not violate it, may it be granted to me to enjoy life and art, being honored with fame, and so on. And this is the fifth century BC. Now, Margaret Mead, in a very interesting private communication um, in 1961, acknowledged this, and I'm sure many of you have seen this quote, but I'm, I'm bringing it out for the sake of completeness. She said, for the first time in our tradition with Hippocrates, there was a complete separation between killing and curing. Throughout the primitive world, the doctor and the sorcerer tended to be the same person, which is still the case, as I've said, in many cultures. He had the power, sorry, that's a typo, to kill, oh, he with the power to kill had power to cure, including especially the undoing of his own killing activities. In other words, he might, the shaman or the witch doctor, the traditional healer, might choose to try to kill someone and then have to try to undo the effects of what he had done. He who had the power to cure would necessarily also be able to kill. With the Greeks, the distinction was made clear. One profession, the followers of Asclepius, the physicians of the day, were to be dedicated completely to life under all circumstances, regardless of rank, age, or intellect. The life of a slave, the life of the emperor, the life of a foreign man, the life of a defective child. This is a priceless possession which we cannot afford to tarnish. But, I think she says very significantly, society is always attempting to make the physician into a killer to kill the defective child at birth, or to leave the sleeping pills for the cancer patient. It's the duty of society to protect the physician from such requests. So it's difficult to understand the impact that this had on medicine and medical ethics over the next 1,600 years. 
This ethical position led not only to the development of doctor-patient relationships. The nursing profession, in nursing, one of the things that I was doing when I was in Cameroon, West Africa, was speaking at a nursing graduation ceremony. And they take something similar to the Hippocratic Oath. It's called the Nightingale Pledge. And it's very closely uh, approximate to the um, Hippocratic Oath. It also led to the development of ethical pharmaceuticals. It led to the development of hospitals. At the same time, as I alluded to earlier, the other seeds leading to current reproductive health ethics were beginning to come out of dormancy. Interestingly enough, it was through art that Hellenism began to permeate and influence European and American thought through individuals such as Johann Joachim Winckelmann, the German art historian, and the romantic poets John Cates, Percy Bysshe Shelley, and Lord Byron. So Hellenism, as a movement in the 18th and 19th century, um, had a number of uh, outcomes, a number of influences in American and European thought and society. One was the revival of Greek architecture, architecture and building. For example, the Brandenburg Gate um, was an example of Hellenism's influence on architecture. At the same time as the discovery or the rediscovery of what was perceived to be the glory of Greece and the glory of Rome, um, there was enormous cultural influence exerted. Greek culture was seen as a model of beauty, philosophy, art, and politics. And this revival of Greek culture carried other Greek ideas into Europe and America. The Romantic poets were part of the same social stratum as the Huxleys and others. Simultaneously, Herbert Spencer, Charles Darwin, Darwin's cousin Francis Galton, began to advance their theories of natural selection, which ultimately led to social Darwinism through Spencer and the eugenics movement. They, in turn, were drawing upon Thomas Malthus's work um, in the 1700s. It can be seen, therefore, that directly or indirectly, the roots of abortion, eugenics, infanticide, and euthanasia are rooted in Greek and Roman philosophy. The social Darwinists and later eugenicists drew from these roots to develop new utilitarian social and reproductive ethics and to justify these ethics. As we know, the social Darwinists and eugenics movements continue to evolve, eventually giving birth to Nazi, Nazi Germany's program to create a master race, as well as the modern contraception and population control movements and the globalization of abortion. In particular, Margaret Sanger, who Planned Parenthood is trying to um, clean up and rehabilitate as simply a, a women's rights activist, um, but who very clearly participated in the eugenics movement of the uh, 20, early and mid 20th century, um, was very much influenced by social Darwinism. And I think one can say with some confidence that social Darwinism gave birth to the eugenics movement. The eugenics movement had a number of uh, proponents um, in Europe and in the United States. Um, it's not very well known at this point, but there's quite a fascinating history about it. There were eugenics um, clubs in virtually every state in the United States. Families which were seen as being superior families would be displayed at fairs similarly to the way you would display a, a prized bull or a prized heifer. There were uh, discussions about the genetic weeds, as Margaret Sanger called them. These were Eastern Europeans, um, North African, uh, Central Europeans, um, and Jewish people who were seen as genetic weeds. And in fact, if you look at some of the discussion around pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and early pregnancy genetic diagnosis, um, you'll see it called genetic weeding. And that's a direct reflection of these earlier terms, these early eugenic terms. Now, while in the United States, the goals of creating a master race were not as clearly elucidated, um, there, was, there were many campaigns to sterilize especially my um, particular institution, Duke University, performed a number of uh, eugenic sterilizations on African Americans, people who were felt to be uh, mentally unfit, socially unfit, to, who were felt to have criminal tendencies. Um, they performed sterilizations, they performed castrations. And so this is a very ugly part of our history. But these led to the modern population control movements and the globalization of abortion. So I think the next two slides are a little graphic, but they're making a point. This is a photograph by one of my colleagues, Reggie Littlejohn, up from her program. This is a young woman who had a late-term abortion, and that's her fetus in the bed next to her. The reason I'm showing this, um, which is graphic and horrible picture, number one, has to do with the fact that 
I have never performed an abortion, but I belonged, uh, I trained at an institution where abortion was performed up to very late in gestation. It takes considerable skill to perform an abortion like this without killing a woman. And so the natural question that I, as an obstetrician, ask is, who taught a Chinese physician to do this? The answer is USAID and UNFP uh, taught uh, physicians and clinicians how to do these procedures. So a consequence of our embracing eugenics and population control uh, projects and ideology is this, that we've not only embraced it for ourselves, but we've taught other countries to do it. And as a Christian, I have to ask myself that there's no way that God cannot be offended by this. Now, in the 1980s, these sorts of ideas and these sorts of images and concepts of population control and what was then called demographic targeting had acquired negative connotations, to no one's surprise. Deliberate decisions were made to repackage these agendas using the language of women's rights and reproductive rights. Why? Because the idea of zero population growth had become unpalatable. People understood that forced abortion, forced sterilization were wrong. They understood that uh, directly linking um, uh, aid to countries based on their decisions to have uh, population control programs in place were unpalatable, especially to Americans in the 1980s. Now, this is a tiny slide. Oh, it's actually came out larger than I thought. I'm just going to sort of summarize a couple of issues. Um, this is, this uh, slide came from a presentation that was researching the history of the uh, reproductive health movement starting in the 1980s. So I'm going to read, I won't read the whole thing, but just going to summarize a bit. The concept, it says, of reproductive health arose in the 1980s with a growing movement away from population control and demographic targets toward a more, hol more holistic approach. It was not until the ICPD, the International Congress on Population and Demography, and the Fourth World Conference on Women that the concept gained international acceptance. It brought two guiding important principles of reproductive health. Number one, that empowering women and improving their status are important ends and essential for achieving sustainable development, and reproductive rights are inextricable from basic human rights, rather than something belonging to the realm of family planning. It then goes on to say that this conference was instrumental in formalizing the paradigmatic shift in how women's health was conceptualized and how services were delivered. The way in which reproductive health was viewed began to change. The focus became the promotion of healthy reproductive lives rather than the pre prevention of sexual morbidity. And so, and the last, down at the bottom, it says, overall, it called for a fundamental rethink of health services provision. So what you have here is a chameleon-like shift in the way in which reproductive health was repackaged. It was no longer a question of population control. It was no longer a question of demographic targeting. But it was expanded to include rights-based ethics language, as well as uh, feminist uh, concepts, conceptions of improving the status of women. Um, even though it's been clearly shown that contraception alone will not improve the status of women. So what I take from this is that we are at a juncture where medicine has regressed from the legitimacy it gained through Hippocrates' rejection of the healer-killer role to embracing the role of physicians again as healers and killers. And that was seen in the previous photographs of the young women who had had uh, late abortions. And this is aided in the United States by materialism and situational and relativistic ethics. Now, as an obstetrician, abortion is something that I deal with on a regular basis, not only because part of my responsibility as a clinician is to care for women who have undergone abortion, but I get into confrontations with abortionists. One of the confrontations has to do with the fact that they do, once they perform an abortion, they absolve themselves of all responsibility for a patient. And I had a very, uh, shall we say, uh, conflicted discussion with, a, with an abortionist who, um, in the process of performing one, um, perforated the woman's uh, uterus and injured her bowel. And I had to take her to the operating room and open her up. And it was, it was really quite a mess. So I called and I said, you knew that you perforated this woman when you did this surgery? And he said, yes. I said, then why didn't you send her to the hospital? And he had nothing to say. I said, 
Was it because you were afraid that you wouldn't get paid, that you'd get in trouble for having to account for this complication? And he didn't say anything. And I said, this is malpractice, okay, this is malpractice. I don't have a way of forcing you to get sued because the patient will never sue you. She's too ashamed and she's too sick right now anyway. But it's the materialism. You know, abortion is a very profitable industry. It's a very, very profitable industry. And when I discuss with abortionists why do you, why do, you do this, the reasons for them doing it have very little to do, it's a woman's right. I feel that I'm helping this woman to deal with an unwanted pregnancy. Um, and so it's, it's very much based in a relativistic um, and situational type of, uh, of ethics that ultimately, um, when you truly confront them, they, they really and truly don't have an answer. Now, I've talked about the transformation of reproductive health. And George Weigel, one of my colleagues, uh, describes the need for, robust, for a robust moral public culture. Now, the defense and confirmation of such a culture very much depends on a clearly articulated Christian ethical framework for reproductive health. In turn, such illuminated bioethics can shape the worldview, practice, and behavior of physicians who are the chief agents of the practices of the culture of life or conversely of the culture of death. Um, recently, the American College of Obstetrician Gynecologists, which I am still a, a member of, um, did a survey to find out how many OBGYNs actually perform abortions, and the results were actually very interesting. 10% of uh, obstetricians perform 100% of the abortions, with the exception of maybe about 3% that are performed for, by non-clinicians. So what that's saying is 90% of us don't perform abortions. And I became very interested in that statistic. And when you begin to talk to people, you find that in general, the number of physicians who are doing abortion, especially those who are doing late-term abortion, is on the decline. Um, partly it's that there's a sense of, uh, there's an increasing sense that this is a moral and social evil that we should not be participating in. But if you had 90% of the members of a profession, and we're actually, there aren't really that many of us in the United States. There aren't that many, there, there aren't even maybe 10,000 OBGYNs in the United States. If you had 90% of the members of a profession who did not agree with and did not perform this procedure, why is it still being done? And the reason is that there is an ethical point of view among OBGYNs that says that I won't do them, but I don't want to tell somebody else not to do them. And so in addressing this issue around reproductive health, we have to admit that the instrumentality, the, 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 the people who are actually allowing this to happen um, are my colleagues. Now, um, George points out, uh, George Weigel points out correctly, I believe the current discourse on such topics as abortion and euthanasia is dominated by utilitarianism as well as rights-based ethics. So while I don't believe that the decision to perform or undergo abortion is inherently a political one, it has social and therefore political ramifications. Um, but we have to be concerned with the heart of the individual who's doing the procedure because if there were no OBGYNs doing abortions, our task would be very different. How do we bring about this trans transformation in ethics and practice? We can f look at the current state of reproductive health and feel despair at the enormity and complexity of the task. Not only is it a situation simply of the availability of abortion, it's the societal expectation that uh, women will have abortion as a backup to failed contraception. And how do you begin to approach that? You can say in, in very sort of formal terms, well, you can look at the supply side and the demand side, but this is, this is, a, this is a very large and very pervasive problem. It's not a greater problem than the prohibition of infanticide by the early church or uh, by the prohibition of twin infanticide in 19th century Calabar, now Nigeria, or the abolition of sati, bride burning, by the British in India and the banning of foot binding in China. These are all societal evils pertaining to women and children. For example, sati, which was practiced in India, um, occurred when a woman's husband died and his wives were then required to throw themselves on the funeral pyre. The British uh, missionaries in India said that this was wrong and abhorrent, and they began to outlaw it. And it, it took about 20 or 30 years, but sati was outlawed. 
And a look at the early church gives us clues as to how this can be done. The early church came into being through 12 men, most of whom were martyred for their faith. Christianity was a very minor religion in a very pagan world. In the ancient world, as we've seen, abortion was known and practiced. Sexual immorality surpassed even our own licentious age. Greek and Roman writers write about accepted social practices among men who typically had at least four classes of sexual partners. Adultery on the part of women with slaves was common. This is one of the reasons why women sought sterilization, for, um, the ability to um, sterilize themselves with herbs. And this fueled the demand for abortion, contraception, sterilization, bestiality was practiced. So then how did a tiny movement in the Roman Empire overcome pagan ways and become the dominant faith of Western civilization? The first Christians started with only a few people around 33 AD, but grew to 25 or even 35 million in 300 years. How did this happen? It occurred because of the nature of God. Matthew 13, 33 says that the kingdom of God is like yeast, and uh, that it works itself through the entire ball of dough until the ball of dough is leavened. Um, an analogy I use with the teenagers I work with, because I work with at-risk teens, is the kingdom of God is like Ebola virus, okay? That once you get it, you can't help but transmitting it to other people, and it works its way through the entire society. Now, why is it important that the kingdom of God is like yeast? Because yeast starts small, and then it grows. And this was what happened with the first century and the second century church, is that they started small and they grew. The transformation of those societies also occurred because their witness to the non-believers and their commitment to the weak, the vulnerable, and to the poor. For example, in these times, we talk, I mentioned earlier that in, um, infants who were not acknowledged by the father or that were born out of wedlock or otherwise rejected would be exposed. The Christians would go and collect those infants and adopt them into their families and raise them as Christians. So their witness to the non-believers and their commitment to the weak and the poor and their commitment to um, the recognition of human dignity were what distinguished them from the prevailing culture and what enabled them ultimately to transform culture. So a preeminent way that we challenge current definitions of reproductive health is through the a recognition of human dignity. Now, what do I mean by human dignity? What are the components of human dignity? And why does it matter? The most important thing I think that um, I think helps us to recognize and to oppose the culture of death and to recognize and oppose these uh, terrible aspects of um, reproductive health are, is the fact that humans are made in the image of likeness of God from conception to natural death. The embryo is as human as the aged person. Um, I'll hear my colleagues debating this in the area of euthanasia, um, and they'll talk about cognition being a uh, condition for not um, ending a person's life, in other words, for not performing um, euthanasia. And I'll point out, well, when human beings are in the deepest level of sleep, there's not a lot of cognition. So would you kill them? Because you can't recognize cognition in that person who's deeply asleep. A person in deep general anesthesia has no, you can't recognize any cognitive processes going on. Would you then kill them because they're deeply in general anesthesia? The essence of this is that because human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, they have inherent worth and dignity, regardless of <clears throat> how they appear to us. And then, of course, we all have worth because God knows and loves human beings before they are born, and because he's loved us from before the foundation of the world. Um, Isaiah 44, 1 states, um, before you, uh, in Jeremiah 1, 5, rather, it states, before you were born, I knew you, and I called you to be a prophet from before you were born, from, from the time you were in your mother's womb. Psalm 139 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that before I was born, you saw me, you saw me um, while all of the parts of my body, the members of my body, were not yet constructed. You saw me and you knew me. No human is worthless because he's created us to be in fellowship with him. And actually a graphic example of this has been told in the story of Helen Keller. You know, um, Helen Keller, and again, this, this is something else that I think uh, uh, 
we just need to recognize the contribution of those who um, reached out to and began schools for the deaf, school for the blind and, so, blind, and so on and so forth. But Helen Keller, as most of you know, was a young woman who lived um, in the 20th century. Um, she was exposed to rubella, German measles at an early age, and so she was deaf, blind, and dumb. She was institutionalized, but uh, at that time there was an outreach, a school that was begun for children who were deaf, dumb, and blind. And so they began to slowly teach her to um, recognize uh, um, through the sen her sense of touch to begin to communicate with them. And so because they were Christians, one of the questions they asked her when they finally began to communicate with her is through sign language, but it's more than that. It's a tactile type of sign language. They said, do you know about God? Do you know who God is? And she responded to them, who's God? And the person said, God created the universe. Um, he's the God of creation. And his son, Jesus Christ, came to save us. And she responded, oh, yes, I know him. I just didn't know what his name was. And so God reached out to a deaf, dumb, and blind girl that people had basically thrown away and revealed himself to this girl. And that story is so amazing to me because what it says is that he created her, even in her st the state that she was in, he created her to be in fellowship with him. And he reached out to her. She didn't have a way to convey that. She didn't know who God was. But he revealed himself to her. And there's an additional sort of corporeal foundational component to human di dignity, which we apprehend through the incarnation. Um, my husband's a seminary graduate, and so you know, he was always urging me to read Athanasius on the Incarnation, which is a wonderful, which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful book. But the Incarnation helps us to understand human dignity, and this is a powerful thing in these discussions about reproductive health. This is a very powerful thing that I've come to um, understand and, and uh, use in speaking to people about the flaws of reproductive health um, worldview and ways to try to begin people to begin to get people to look at this differently. We understand that Christ is the Son of God. He's the all-powerful God of the Bible, and he came to earth as a man. It says in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant or a slave, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Therefore God has exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, um, I love this picture. It's, it's from uh, a, it's actually from in vitro fertilization, which is not something that I love. But it's making a point, which I think is very profound. This particular picture is capturing the moment where the male and female pronuclei are emerging to become an embryo. Now, why did, I, why did I choose this? If you think about the incarnation, you think about Mary, and you think about uh, Jesus coming into the world, you see some very striking, some, there's some very striking revelation about that. The Gnostics, which were a heresy, uh, which is a heretical group of people in the first century, did not believe that Christ came in bodily form. One of the reasons that they rejected this, and one of the reasons why the Greeks rejected this as well, is that the idea of God coming in a human form was repugnant to them. But the fact of the matter is, is that the word of God says that when the angel Gabriel came to Mary, he said to her, um, blessed are you above all women, and blessed will be the fruit of your womb. And Mary said, well, you know, she was surprised at this, and then she said, well, you know, how is this going to happen? And then Gabriel tries to explain it. And I love it that this is in Luke, because Luke is a physician, and he's trying to, he's trying to figure this thing out as well, okay? He's trying to understand how this could happen as well. But if you think about it, Jesus could have come in any form that he wanted to. He could have come as a spirit. He could have come as an adult man. But he chose to come as an embryo. He chose to come through the humility of becoming flesh, being an embryo, um, being a fetus, 
going through the humbling process of being born, I've probably delivered well over a thousand children in my career. And I can tell you, it's not a dignified process. It's not a dignified process for the baby. It's not a dignified process for the mother. So the idea that the God of the universe would choose to humble himself, to become an embryo, to enter into an embryo, to go through the process of gestation, there must be something to that. Okay? There's, there's a reason why he did that. And I think that it's because Christ's incarnation dignified conception, gestation, labor, and birth. It dignified the person of the woman and with a dignity that had been lost in the Garden of Eden. And so through that process, we see that there's a sacredness to and a dignity to human life because God chose to identify himself with us in the very way that we are created through the union of sperm and egg. Now, obviously, you know, there wasn't a union of sperm and egg. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. But he chose to identify in the minutest way with us. And therefore, there is a sacredness to that and a dignity to that that comes out of that that is not simply a mechanistic uh, process happening. There is uh, God-given not just God-given potential, but God-given reality in the process of conception, gestation, labor, and birth. Now, um, there was, a, as I said, a dignity had been lost in the person of the woman because this really, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, where the, uh, um, Adam and Eve sin, they fall, they uh, are divided because of the curse, and it goes on to say that, um, and there's a lot of misinterpretation around this particular verse. It says that um, in sorrow you will bring forth your children, but actually the real, a better translation of that is in labor or in difficulty you bring forth your children. And the Hebrew is the same as in Proverbs where it says in all labor there is profit, in all hard work there's profit. So it's not that labor was meant to be a painful process, it was meant to be a difficult process. Um, and this particular division that occurs in the garden is the real beginning of the war on women. Why? Because the male and female roles are distorted and because the enemy, our enemy, Satan, the adversary, um, is constantly, from that moment on, is constantly at war with women. It says, I will put enmity between you and your seed um, and between him and uh, his seed. Now, this division ended at Pentecost. Um, the ancient world was forced to recognize Christ in simple men and women because the power that raised Christ from the grave was at work in them from the time of Pentecost. And this speaks directly to my uh, question, how do we affect this transformation? Transformation will not occur without a wholehearted embracing of a meta-ethical framework. And by meta-ethical, I mean a framework that looks to ethics outside of ourselves. It's not just based in natural law or... Um, or codified law, the, the law that's set forth in the Bible. But it's based in, in a framework that says that there, is, uh, there are ethics that originate outside of ourselves. There are ethics that originate in the realm, the spiritual realm, in the realm of the divine. And these proclaim the truth regarding human dignity that Christ came to save men and women. Now, in terms of our ethical practice, as I've said, there's reason for hope. 90% of OBGYNs do not perform abortions. The number of abortions is declining annually. And this, these are some figures from the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report that show that uh, from a high of, in this particular slide, eight, slightly over 800,000 um, abortions, um, the number of abortions are declining. I think there are a number of reasons for that. But one of the major reasons is that I think that there is a slow and steady uh, process going on um, in society where people are individually being, beginning to recognize that abortion is wrong. And we've spoken extensively of the significance of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, Hippocratic ethics are not in and of themselves Christian. That's why the uh, Pro-Life OBGYN Association, of which I'm a member, um, states clearly that we are not, strictly speaking, we are founded on Christian principles, so that we, but we, um, welcome anyone who uh, embraces Hippocratic ethics. This is because Muslims and Hindus may also embrace Hippocratic ethics as well. But in 
codifying uh, ethics for physicians, uh, Hippocrates was anticipating Christ because he fulfilled the, um, um, 500 years later, Christ fulfilled these ethics or demonstrated what these ethics look like, look like by not only requiring right behavior but love and correct motives when he declared the ethics of the kingdom. So how do we live this out? How do we actually, on a daily basis, in our lives, in our involvement, and in our engagement with culture, in our interactions, um, and in our efforts to um, work through public policy and legislative agendas, how do we actually live this out? Number one, I think that we have to choose to oppose ethical frameworks which deny the dignity of human beings. In my profession, as I'm saying, as I said earlier, this is a process of direct confrontation. You know, my institution, abortions are done at my institution. And so um, there is a fair amount of conflict around the whole process of making a decision about how to speak to someone. Um, and there's a tension between wanting to say to them, abortion is wrong, um, abortion is a moral and social evil, and reaching out to that person and saying, as I said to an abortionist, you know, you and I disagree about this, but let's talk about why you feel that it's necessary. What is important about um, abortion that you feel the need to do this? And language is important. Very often, um, you can be involved in uh, discussions about reproductive health, and you have to begin to ask people the question, well, what do you exactly mean by reproductive health? How do you see reproductive health as being codified? What are the specific ethics that are underlying it? We have to practice cultural engagement. Um, and this is one of the things that's very heartening to me as well. You know, I have two children, one in college and one about to uh, go to college. And their generation is the most pro-life generation I have seen in, in, in my career. They're amazingly pro-life. But that comes about because they are willing to engage the culture, sometimes engage the culture very deeply in confronting people and bringing about the, a change in mindset and a change in worldview. We also have to love the abortionists. You know, one of the remarkable things about Dr. Martin Luther King was that he did not, in the days of the Civil Rights Movement, again, this isn't something that you um, will read very often on Wikipedia, for example, um, but one of the things that he said is that you have to love the people, the segregationists. You have to love the, the members of the Klan. You have to love the people that are uh, beating you and turning dogs loose on you and turning um, fire hoses on you. Why? Why do you have to love them? Because they are in the process, he said that they are degraded and made less human, that they want to make you as an African-American person less human. But they, in and of themselves, are degraded and made less human by their hatred. And so the abortionists are in the same situation. They're degraded and made less human because they make human life not human. And so to reach out to them and to be able to say to them, they're under, let's, let's look at human dignity. That, let's look at what God had to say about human life. Let's even look at the incarnation. And that's how people are won over. But we, we do have to love them. We can't hate them for being that way. And as I said, um, our goal is not an earthly kingdom or dominion. You know, all the kingdoms of the earth will bow the knee to Christ. So we're looking for individual salvation and the creation of a just and virtuous society. But I do believe that that will come about um, through our witness, um, through how we walk out our witness, through how we interact and how we engage with the culture and uh, how we seek to overturn the defective ethical frameworks that exist around reproductive health. Thank you very much. So there will be no breakout sessions after this. We'll now proceed to question period. We have some time for questions. Uh, if you just come up to the microphones and introduce yourself and ask your question, Monique will respond. Uh, hi, I'm Brian Pilkington from Aquinas College. Thank you for a very thoughtful talk. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the content of the concept of human dignity, which sure. played such a large role in the argument. And Wait, which relates to what? Which uh, play, seemed to play a large role in your argument. Yes. Uh, and how it relates to 
the transformation, especially uh, given to the deep moral disagreement in the culture. Sure. Thank okay. you. Okay. Absolutely. I'm willing to do that. And I had a video. Can you guys roll that that MP3 for me? Sure. Um, I th it's a great question, and I do believe that the question of human dignity is really is really central here. Um, not just for abortion, which again I'm sort of betraying my bias, okay, because this is something that that's very much uh, sort of at the forefront, um, but also for questions of euthanasia. I think that um, the issue of human dignity has to be developed on several levels. Number one, as I said. <clears throat> a recognition that human beings were, are made in the image of God. If we don't, oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, you can cut off the sound for that, I'm sorry. Can I control that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna run this, um, if I can. Can we mute this? And so I think that uh, the question of um, let's see, I lost my train of thought. Okay, so the first point I think in establishing a viewpoint of human dignity is to, again, not be afraid to go to the scriptures to demonstrate that human beings have inherent worth. You know, I, I know that one of the, and I feel actually very strongly about this, that when we try to engage culture and we try to engage individuals, um, without having a strong understanding, a strong grounding in scripture, we really, we really don't have much of a leg to stand on. And I know I'm going out on a limb and saying that, but the reason for that is that if we truly believe what the Bible has to say about who Christ is, what he did, why he came to earth, why he came to earth and what he did, we cannot be afraid to go to that and to say, this is the foundation for what I believe, why? Because ultimately, we will not necessarily win by some kind of crisis of logomachy, okay, by some crisis of, of a war of words. We, we win by convincing people the truth of our argument. And the argument for human dignity is very strong. It's very, very strong. Because even among people like um, Singer, you know, the evolutionary biologist, you know, he's, he's an ardent proponent of euthanasia, but when it came to his own mother, he, he couldn't do it. Why? Because there are other considerations besides kind of a black and white hard edge concept. There's a concept of familial relationship and a concept of dignity related to human, uh, to familial relationship. So I think the first thing to do is to not be afraid of using the scriptures in your argument. The second thing is to say, um, because humans inherently have worth, because they have value, because they're created in the image and likeness of God, we need to treat them as though they're valuable. Um, we need to um, protect those. You, no one's going to argue with protecting the weak and helpless. Okay, no one's going to argue with that. Um, and so you you use the Christian basis of what um, the the Christian ethics of the kingdom, but also the Christian view, the biblical view of who, who human beings are. That we are spiritual beings, that we are physical beings, that we are rational beings, that regardless of how disfigured the image of God, and the image of God, um, the, the, the image of God is also a very important idea because people say, well, I look at people and I don't see the image of God. Because of the fall, the image of God in us is marred. There's no question about it. But we all retain that portion of the image of God um, because we're created in his image and therefore, um, we have to see one another in those terms, in terms of having been created in his image, not that one class of people is different from another. Now, uh, or one group of human beings is different from another, and therefore that group is worthy of being saved, or that group is worthy of being killed. And you can bring that back very easily to, the, to things like the Nazis, okay? Um, I studied, um, I'm on the Institutional Review Board at, uh, at, at Duke, and one of the things that make us really study and look at that's really tough is um, the Nazi doctors and what they did to the, to the Jewish people. It's, it's, you have to look at pictures of what they did. And let me tell you, you, you think that's bad, the, the pictures of the abortions. It's the stuff that they did to, 
people is, is pretty, pretty hardcore and pretty repellent. But the purpose of, of showing that is from the perspective of sort of medical research and so on and so forth. The purpose of showing that is to show that Germany at the time had probably the most advanced system of medicine, the most advanced system of nursing and medical care in the world. And look at the depths of depravity that they sunk to because they decided that one, this one group of people, whether they were Jews or the, the mentally feeble or the disabled, were not, they did not have the same, uh, there was no value to their lives. So I, I hope that answers your question, okay? Yeah, all right, yes, sir. Thank you for an, ex an insightful and inspiring talk. Uh, to your scriptural uh, quotations of life before birth, I would add the story of the visitation from the second chapter of St. Luke. Here you have an elderly prima gravita and a teenage mother who don't ask each other about Liz's amnio and Mary's ultrasound. They greet each other as people. They recognize their fetuses as people and the two fetuses recognize each other as people. I think an amazingly powerful statement about the personhood of people not yet born. No, absolutely. And I could have, I mean, you know, again, as, a, as an OBGYN, you know, I've spent yeah. a lot of time studying these issues in the Bible. And so, for example, when Rachel is pregnant with Jacob and Esau, and the, the children are kind of having a WWF match in her abdomen, as twins often do, and she goes and, and the Lord speaks to her and says, you know, there are two nations in your womb, okay? And so God had already identified that two different nations were going to come out of those children. And again, getting back to the issue of human dignity, if God recognizes us before, our born, uh, before we are born, then ending the life of a fetus is, is, is pretty monstrous. It's pretty monstrous. So yeah, I think that that's a, a really good point. Did you have another? Yeah. Jacob and Esau were the first recorded example of a twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. <laughs> And actually, there's evidence in, um, in Genesis that uh, Cain and Abel were also twins. Because if you look at the language, again, in Hebrew, and again, my husband is a Hebrew scholar, it says that uh, Eve conceived, and then she had um, Abel, and then she bore again. It doesn't say that she conceived again and had another baby. It said that she had another baby. So it, there, there's some evidence that they were twins. So, um, Yes? I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. Um, I think the pro-life movement had one of its more visible moments um, in the last decade over the past uh, six months with the uh, Planned Parenthood videos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I, I think what maybe was initially th thought or hoped to be a great opportunity for the pro-life movement, at least just my informal conversations with those that aren't necessarily, don't necessarily identify with either side, but, but fill in that great gray middle where they're not quite sure what to do about what, what to think or what to, um, what to think about abortion. Um, I, I think it may have turned into a, a big negative um, in terms of the perception of the pro-life community that the, that the end result of the messaging and the, the dialogue on that was that the pro-life pro movement is, was deceitful and, and, uh, and conniving and that that was ultimately the public sort of um, perception of that. And so I was curious, um, as someone who's active in the pro-life movement, what, what your thoughts are? Yeah, I think um, there was a great deal of controversy, I think, about um, whether or not the videos would be helpful or harmful. I think there are two ways to look at it. Um, one is that I think that the charges of uh, sort of a lack of integrity or deception are really specious. Um, investigative journalists do this all the time. So I, I think that sort of having a different standard because the, they happen to be investigating plant, plant Parenthood as opposed to a journalistic sting operation in you know, a gambling den or whatever, um, deception of that sort, even in research, is actually considered ethical if um, you're looking at these activities which may or may not be criminal. So I, 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 I kind of toss that out. I think that the usefulness of um, Mr. Delayden's videos is that it kind of pulls the mask off of 
altruistic sounding phrases about abortion, that we do abortion because it benefits women and it's really not about money and so on and so forth. And it shows the extent to which abortion has dehumanized the people who are doing, number one, it does two things. It shows mercenary motives. And number two, it shows the extent to which abortion has dehumanized people to the point where you can begin to look at uh, uh, fetuses in terms of a liver or brain tissue or kidneys. And, and, and there are certain types of evidence that you need to see because when it's right in front of your face, you can't deny that it's true anymore, okay? And so as graphic as they are and as controversial as they are, I think that you have, people have to sometimes be presented with certain types of evidence whereby they decide, I'm gonna ignore this, la, 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 I'm not gonna pre pretend that that doesn't exist, or I'm gonna look at it and say, this, this, is, this is worse than I ever thought it could be, you know? It's kind of like the pictures I was showing of the, the, the Chinese women. You know, people, I, I've gotten some heat and some criticism for showing those pictures, and I said, when you see things like that, abortion is not a, it's not an abstract thing anymore. It's, it's a reality, okay? And it's not just that you need to see an abortion to appreciate. Oh, this, by the way, is a, it's online. It's called, a, it's a YouTube video called Before You Were Born. And these are living fetuses that are actually being examined um, using fetoscopy, which I just love. So anyway, um, so I think ultimately they were helpful. Um, I also think that their helpfulness was sort of revealed by the intense reaction from Planned Parenthood because if they didn't feel threatened, there wouldn't have been like this virulent and, and violent reaction. Um, but I think that it's really hard for people to look at the truth. And in, in our society, you know, we, we are we're sort of insulated. I saw this when I went to Africa. You know, people don't have money and institutions and societal frameworks to, inst to insulate them from from pain and injustice and truth. They have to see it as it really is. Um, so yeah, I think ultimately they were helpful. I do think that they were helpful. Yes. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, discussion and lecture. Uh, it reminds me of when Mother Teresa visited uh, President Clinton and stood on stage with him and said, do not have abortions, I'll take every child that you want to give me, I will take care of them. And it uh, reminds us that we need to step up to the plate and do our part as you have, and I thank you. But also it brings a second to the mind of, in the Observer, the, st the student newspaper, they talk about the Laerte Medal being presented to the top, one of the top Catholics for service to the country and being given to President, uh, Vice President Biden, who was pro-abortion. Now he's done many other good things, and I would venture to say that our president is Christian, and most of those pro-abortion people in the Congress uh, and the justices on the Supreme Court are Christian. Just leave it open to your commentary about education, because these people are obviously know the scripture. Yeah, I think it's a good, um, I don't know what happened to my video here, but I'm gonna just close it out. So um, I think it's a really good point. You know, one of the reasons why I think that, uh, and, and I'm gonna really go out on a limb here, Carter, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but I, I really think that one of the failures of the pro-life movement, uh, movement has been the fact that uh, we, and I include myself as someone who's, who's fairly active in the pro-life movement, um, have not emphasized the, we've emphasized sort of the legislative and uh, sort of legal issues and sort of policy issues without really emphasizing that the issue is a hard issue. Because I, I don't think that you can effectively, as, as, as I was saying before, our witness is compromised when we don't bring the uh, concept of that, that Christ died for people, and that's why people are valuable, that people count because they're made in the image and likeness of God, that when we strictly focus on sort of the, the act of abortion, the perpetration of abortion, the woman who has an abortion, we, we don't have moral authority. We just don't have moral authority because you could, you could end all abortion in the United States. It, you, you probably, you could do that, you know, you could do that. But, you, but without sort of a, a, a concurrent change 
in, in the hearts of people, in, in people's sort of um, moral ethics, in our public ethics, in our personal moral ethics, I'm not sure that that would, that would be a, a solution, really. I'm not. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going out on a limb to say that, but I, I really feel that the, the, the whole reason that you know, life issues like abortion, euthanasia, and so on and so forth have come about, to, to quote my friend um, Donna Harrison, is it's a, it's a failure. She says it's a failure of catechesis, and I, and I sort of understand what she's saying. I sort of understand what she's saying. We consider ourselves to be a Christian nation, but in point of fact, we, we really are not. We're really not. We have people who say that they're Christians, but in practice and witness, we don't see that. And so to, to, to sincerely want to address all of these issues, I think, is, is going to take a, a commitment to um, a commitment to proclaiming the truth, and the truth is Christ. And, and it's going to take that. To, that's what's going to ultimately change things. Yeah. So, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm an emergency medicine resident mm -hmm. in New York. And my question is, it seems everything you've said has been great. The biggest problem that I've found in clinical practice to date um, has been the 17-year-old whose mom doesn't want her to get pregnant and wants her to be on a depo shot. or Wants her to what? To be on, to be on depo or something to prevent mm -hmm, pregnancy. Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. um, the man or woman who comes into the ER uh, with an STD, and my fellow practitioners um, believe they're doing good in giving them contraceptives to prevent bad outcomes like infertility or a teen pregnancy or what have you. And I don't know, I'm wondering how you do this in your practice. I don't know how in a 15 minute interval to inspire somebody uh, to, ha I mean, it seems to, to give the alternative vision, which is fidelity and marriage and monogamy. I don't know how to give that to them when they're going to go home, you know, to, especially in the lower sec socioeconomic strata, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm, so many things mm -hmm. which uh, will prevent them from having the support that they would need or the ongoing um, resources. So I, what do you do when that person sure, shows up in sure. your office? What do you uh, to, me, to me, your question is where the rubber hits the road, you know, and, and I, you know, without talking to everyone, I don't know who's practicing medicine or who's not. Um, but to me, your, your question is really where the rubber, rubber hits the road because there's a sense in which very often we um, talk to our patients about the, um, you know, the choices that they make. The, the first thing that I do, because um, I've been working in underserved populations for, I ran an OBGYN city, OBGYN service at an inner city health clinic. Um, currently I work with women veterans who um, are pretty, they, they're a, a population of women that has tremendous, tremendous needs, tremendous issues. Um, in my clinic, about 80% of them uh, suffered sexual assault while they were in the military, and they have PTSD from that. And so there are a lot of bad outcomes. People have mental illness, they act out sexually, they have many, many sex partners. So in, the, in terms of, you know, as an ED doc, you know, in terms of the 15 minute, the first thing that, that you do is you think about when you're, when, when you've seen that patient um, who comes in with an STD, or you've seen that patient where the mother is saying, you know, look, I want her on depo. The first thing you have to recognize is that all you can do is try to convince them of the truth. You cannot make people, you know, accept the truth one way or the other. Second, that it is important to proclaim the truth. And so what I tell my patients is, there is a moral standard that you can aspire to, okay? You want, you know, taking pills and getting a shot, getting contraception is not, in and of itself will not help you to reach that moral standard. That, um, that moral standard, and I'm, I'm pretty, pretty upfront with them, that moral standard is, comes through Christ. And that Christ is the only one that can help your life because all the other issues that you're facing are outgrowths of that. Now you may not feel like you have the freedom to say that, okay? Yeah, that's and I and right. So what you can just say is, and what I'll say to them is that there's a better way to live than coming into the ED constantly, getting a pregnancy test or getting pregnant and then having an abortion. There's a better way to live. Do you want me to? Do you want me to talk to you about that? 
And some people will want to and some people won't. And if they want to, then I'll say to them, and, and, and you'll be amazed at how often for the ones that say that they, like this happened to me last week. I had a patient that um, had been extensively victimized in the military. And she had actually gotten into an altercation because she jumped on one of my nurses and tried to choke her. And so then they said, well, she's coming to see you. I'm like, whoa, OK. you know. And uh, when I came in, she was just very frustrated and angry. So I just kind of sat for a while. And then I just started asking her questions. I said, well, what happened to you? Why are you like this? And she started crying. And she said, well, this is what happened to me. And this is why um, I, I, I do these things. And I don't understand why I do them. And you know, I've gotten pregnant. I've had abortions. I want to change. And I don't know how. You've just opened, she's just opened the door. And I, I just, I kicked the door open and went in and started talking to her. And I said, when I said went in, I kind of got into her space. And I said, you know, um, you don't have to live this way. There's a better way to live. Do you want me to pray for you? I'll start off with praying for people. And I mean, the first time you do it, you're like, is this legal? Can I actually, well, you can do this. Okay, you can do it. You can do it, but, but you have to, I think in a very significant way, you have to be led by the Spirit of God to understand who's going to listen to what you're saying and who's ready to hear what you have to say. Because at any individual clinical encounter, all you may be doing is planting a seed. But just by saying, there's something better. You don't have to live this way. And if you don't feel comfortable giving that prescription, I don't really use Depo anymore because of the bone density issue. But if you don't really feel comfortable with that, the idea of just randomly prescribing contraception, then, then you shouldn't do it. You don't have to do it. If people come to me asking for Plan B. I'm like, I don't, I don't, do, I don't prescribe Plan B. I don't prescribe Ella. You know, I don't insert IUDs for unintended pregnancy. I, I just don't do that. And, and they'll say, why? I say, because if you are pregnant, I have a moral standard that says that I will not Cause, do anything to cause that child to abort. So I think, and you prepare yourself, and you think, okay, how can I get what I, how can I impart this in the shortest period of time? And you have to kind of think it through ahead of time as to how you're going to do it and how it might happen in any individual sort of clinical encounter. But you can. You can do that. You can do it. And it, cre it takes some creativity and a little bit of courage, because like I said, you may feel like, well, can I really pray with this person? But what you'll find is that once you start talking, a lot of women are so desperate and so broken that even in that 15-minute period of time, they're going to want to listen to what you have to say. And even if all you have done is planted a seed, you don't know that that seed, that seed may come up. That seed may come up. So. This is the last question. Okay, sure. Oh. Hi, uh, Bob Scott, uh, radiologist. Uh, I wonder if you comment on uh, the use of 3D ultrasound as a way to uh, at least show people the personhood, demonstrate the personhood of the fetus. Uh, there might be some population that you're not going to be able to really drill in the spiritual, you know, worth of human dignity, but you know, just kind of a gut reaction of seeing, you know, the very early like the, uh, the images that you were showing, you know, but with showing their own pregnancy. Do you have any experience with that? Yeah, I actually, I actually have a lot of experience with that. So when I was in Boston, um, I uh, actually, this is a very, very, very early model that I was involved with. We're a crisis pregnancy center, and then I had my private practice right next door. So I would perform ultrasound for them. Um, on uh, women who came in in crisis. And then if uh, through counseling they decided to keep their children, I would take them into my practice and then do their delivery. So that was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. So I would say over the course of a uh, year and a half or so, I probably did about 30 ultrasounds on women who were in crisis and who were considering um, having an induced abortion. and. What was very interesting was that for some of them, the key was, and this is with 2D ultrasound, not with 3D ultrasound. So for some of them, seeing the sort of the flicker of the heartbeat was just a revelation. And they said, I, I can't, I can't 
kill this baby. For the ones that came in with their mothers or their boyfriends, if the mother or the boyfriend said, well, it doesn't really matter, it's just a blob of tissue, they, they would go on and terminate their pregnancies. So I think that it comes down to an issue of data is often not enough, okay? Sometimes even when people have the data staring them in the face, even when they look at the ultrasound, um, there's actually a, a small study out that shows that if a woman sees, um, is able to see heartbeat or able to see the baby move on ultrasound, um, it reduces her risk of having an abortion by about 30 to 50 percent, which is, which is great, which is great. I don't know that 3D ultrasound, um, and, and again, the, oh, and the other piece is that for people who are interested in termination because of anomalies where the, the baby has Down syndrome or trisomy or um, anencephaly or something like that, um, they are, it's a much more difficult sort of situation to get them to change their minds, but for a different set of reasons. It's not because they don't feel the humanity of the baby, it's because they're not presented with an alternative. And so they believe that, for example, if they have a, a baby who's anencephaly where there hasn't been growth of the cortex of the brain, that, you know, well, what's going to happen? You know, I might as well just terminate this pregnancy now rather than force this child to go through um, the process of delivery and so on and so forth. But that's where things like perinatal hospice, where you have special units where women can deliver and spend time with their children before they die a natural death, become very important. For the early pregnancy, I think that it's much more a counseling issue um, and where you have to especially counsel the person who brought the woman in in the first place. Um, because as I've said, a lot of times if they see that little flicker or they see, you know, that the baby is moving, they'll, I, I can't do this. And that's why a lot of times when um, abortionists are doing ultrasound, they, they'll turn the scanner away so that the, the, the moms can't see the, can't see the scanner because they know that once they see it. But I think in that situation, what becomes really important is just, is the counseling to say this is not a blob of tissue. There, this is a, there's a human being here. So. Thank you very much. Thank you.